I'm on the train to Cambridge to visit Anthony Roland Jones. He is a retired university administrator who has been active as a writer and researcher in the field of recorder performance, history and iconography. It's very typical, of course, of the, 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 the Peasant Association. These are... <clears throat> come, no, the, he, he's obviously a country boy, you can see by his, by his dress. And he, he's simply playing the recorder. And that's a nice association, because whatever you may think of the awful noises made by a large number of kids in primary schools with their plastic desk and recorders, the association with children is very important. It's mentioned in Shakespeare, for example, that the recorders were always associated with children. So it was always seen as an easy instrument. And maybe it's difficult as we're not sufficiently recognised. Of course they were by Ganassi. But Ganassi talks about how, how you have to move your fingers slightly on and off the holes in order to to get these changes in temperament and tuning and also an expression between loud and soft. I mean, that's going right back to Ganassi. And so he's my, my touchstone to start with, obviously for everything I, I've written. Oh, that he'd written a bit more. It is, it is distressingly brief, what he says. Iconography. What started you on that? Well, partly a lifelong interest in art, uh, together with my interest in music and the recorder in particular, but also because it was a, an interest of Walter Bergman, who, whose classes I went to at Morley College when I had my first university appointment. And he had collected about a hundred, a mere hundred, uh, pictures, with, which included the recorder. And I could see that this could be enlarged. And um, there, I suppose, for the interest grew, because I had, I had a starting point from Walter. And what is your fascination with the instrument? I suppose originally it's simplicity. I, I had lessons on the violin, which in a sense are just as straightforward an instrument, but I didn't enjoy the violin. I suppose it was too much hard work at the time. And the, I, eventually I gave those up. And in the meanwhile, because my music teacher for the violin uh, conducted a group of, of youngsters playing drum and fife, I got interested in the tin whistle and learned to play all sorts of things on it. In fact, even gave lessons to other boys at school. Threatened an hour, I think it was. And uh, this, this eventually led to my brother, the older brother, giving me a, a, an Adler German recorder, which didn't interest me because it had two extra holes and I couldn't see what extra notes I was getting. Uh, compared with the tin whistle, which produced it, produced a very good two octaves by simple overblowing. And I didn't really take it up seriously till I went to Oxford, and then I joined the Society of Recorder Players. But I, I think still my interest in the instrument was its basic simplicity. I wrote articles for the newsletter of the Society of Recorder Players on recorder technique. Uh, fairly soon after I left Oxford, it was presumptuous of me, but there we are. They worked all right. And they were copied in the American uh, recorder at the time, whatever its title then was. And Oxford University Press then asked me to uh, shape them up and uh, turn them into a book in their series on the technique of wind instruments. They had one on the Oboe, one on the clarinets and so on, and I was to do the one on the recorder. So that's the beginning of recorder technique, which has twice been thoroughly revised and is now in its third edition. After that I wrote a series of exercises for the treble recorder, which couldn't be included within recorder technique, so you had to use the two together. What I regard as my most important book that's to say, playing recorder sonatas, which again was published by Oxford at Clarendon Press, 
And then more recently, working with the editor who had to go back to New Zealand at the time, I worked as assistant editor and, in fact, the main writer for the Cambridge Companion to the Recorder. So there you have six books, not a single one on iconography, and partly because I couldn't find any publishers who were interested, who thought it was too esoteric an area. And secondly, the enormous expense of getting of paying for copyright from museums which held the originals, which you had to have in the book on iconography. I suppose over the last 15 years or so, I've got down to it really seriously. And then fairly soon after I started, I was contacted by Nicholas in Australia. Nicholas Lander. Nicholas Lander, yes. And he made sense out of my scribbles and notes and so on and turned them into a suitable state to appear as a computer index to record her iconography. But before long, he was himself searching out from other computer sites, it added a great deal to that, and now he's the, the, he's the main person. Though we have people who help us a great deal, particularly from Holland, in finding, uh, looking, searching round for uh, places where they can see recorders in, in works of art. But what kind of research is it? What are you looking for? We're looking for the representation of a recorder in a work of art. Now that, it, that involves making sure that the instrument which you are looking at is a recorder and not an, a relative to the recorder. It's very easy to call the early medieval flageol a recorder, but it's not. It's related to the Irish tin whistle. It has six holes and not eight. And necessarily having the eight holes, though it has enormous advantages, is more complicated. And that only appeared towards the end of the 13th century. So I concentrated my work on the early period, again working with Nicholas, who had already written an article on the early recorder and gaining a great deal from the work of Pierre Moragno in, in Paris on the early history of, of the recorder, and of course from the wonderful work which David Lasowski has been doing in gradually compiling a complete history of the recorder. But drawing on those originals, so to speak, and doing my own uh, looking round and going to museums, churches and so on, all the while searching for these representations. That's how the, uh, how the, the data got, got put together for me then to make generalizations on the way the recorder was used by artists in terms of symbolism. So most of my articles are on the symbolism of the recorder, the way the instruments are used. Recently, I've been much involved with Lully, and I think he's an important person in the history of the recorder, and he's overlooked. And he uses recorder symbolism in very interesting ways. And I've written an article for early music on that subject. The sound of the Baroque recorder in the hands of Lully, and, and, and later, of course, Handel and Bach, is very much more refined sound. Um, and more expressive generally. Now, when I went to give a, a talk in, uh, at Boston in the festival, um, Friedrich von Hühner very kindly lent me an early 18th century recorder and a Renaissance uh, recorder from the, a copy, a good copy of a period of a 16th century recorder. And I simply played one note on each of these instruments and they were actually pitched the same, so that was straightforward enough. But the difference in the sound is really very remarkable, I think, when you put them side by side like that. The status of the instrument is, is very different indeed from what it was going back to 1950, and that period when I first became deeply attached to the instrument. People then did laugh and say, you're not serious, are you? You can't play sonatas on a thing like that. That's a kid's instrument. You don't hear that sort of thing now. And there are, there are a surprising number of people who manage to make a living professionally 
out of playing the recorder, and not simply as teachers, but as as really good, committed prof professionals. Uh, you know, I hope that the recorder is now accepted by other instrumentalists and by the public at large as being an instrument of the 18th and the 16th century in particular, 16th, 17th, 18th century, where it was regarded as very important, every bit as important as the, as the transverse flute. I doubt whether any 20th century artists have used the recorders specifically in the way it was used by artists as having symbolic purposes um, but nevertheless, you do find instruments which look as though they're intended to be recorders in uh, 20th century uh, paintings. So you can't count out the 20th century iconography. And indeed, there's a great deal of it in, in Nicholas's recorder iconography catalogue. Um, but what is interesting, indeed, you're quite right here, that there was in fact little change between the three major areas of, of recorder symbolism between the Renaissance period and the Baroque period. I mean those areas are, are, are basically to do with shepherds, to do with love and marriage, to do with, with death and the supernatural prayer and so on. Uh, there are a series of other uh, sort of meanings which recorders can have, which are used, but th those are the chief areas, very well shown in the works of Lully.